Hey guys, wow, that was a great finals. It was really fun. Um, I'm glad that the, MB that the WNBA decided to change the format for the playoffs this year uh, because it was, it was amazing to witness. It made it so much more fun. And the finals, we got the best possible matchup. And we got to see these two teams clash for five games instead of three in the conference finals that they would have been last year. So, yeah, let's, I'm looking forward to the next season. Hopefully they keep this format, and I'd love to see other sports adapted too. Because, we, you know, we got to see the two best teams clash for the title, and it, it really came down to the wire. It was, it was one of the most fun finals I've ever watched. And, of course, congratulations to Candace Parker. It took a while, but I'm glad you finally got your ring. And hopefully it's just the first of many. I know she's got, like, uh, she looks like she could play another 10 years. You know, she, she's playing at a high level right now. She's at a peak. Greetings and welcome to The Fan Perspective. I'm your host, Nathan Nile, and these are the WNBA off-season power rankings, during which I, basically, I just look back at the entirety of the year, and based, in, based on what they did the previous season, I try to guess where I think teams will end up at the end of next season. And I wanted to do this as soon as possible so that, so that I could avoid you know, having my mind altered by all the off-season moves that they're making. I didn't want to be influenced by coaching changes, new you know, free agents and whatnot. All of that will come later. For now, the off-season power rankings are based entirely off of the 2016 season. And then just before the 2017 season starts, I'll do the preseason power rankings, which will include any free agents, pickups, any trades, and oh, who they drafted and stuff like that. So we start off the list with the stars, which, no surprise for any of you who watch this channel, I love them, I'm from San Antonio, and I will keep rooting for them, and I'd love it if they proved me wrong, but the way that this team looks right now, it looks like a long rebuilding period, and I'm giving them at least three years to really get it together. They've got a new GM right now, they're gonna hire a new head coach, they've got talented playmakers on the roster. They are capable of winning games, but I just don't see them winning consistently enough to get into the playoffs. I think for the next two or three years in a row, they're going to have that number one overall pick. And then, you know, after a couple of years, they've, they've really built up a good core down there. They're going to suddenly just explode into the playoffs and start consistently winning for at least four or five years before they start struggling again. Then we have the Washington Mystics, who, at least for me personally, biggest disappointment of this season. It's hard to accept any time that a Mike Tibault led team doesn't make the playoffs. Emma Mieseman, she's pretty much the only player who played great this season. From start to finish, she was on top of things. She was amazing, but she alone does not have enough of that star power to really carry a team like a Maya Moore, or Diana Taurasi, or Candace Parker can. And even if she did, this is a really tough league, and she's going up against people like Candice Parker, Park, Maya Moore, Diana Taurasi, Elena Deladon, and she's not quite at their level. So I don't know what I don't really know how to fix them because they do have talent on their roster. They have talented playmakers who, if they fit together within the system, they're capable of winning just about any game. But you know, talent alone doesn't win games, as they have consistently proven this year. And I don't know if there is a quick fix. It's hard to say you know, what the future will hold for them. Do they just need one superstar to put them over the top? That could be it. Do they need a complete roster overhaul? Probably not. Let's not get drastic. They do have talent there. Uh, do, do they just need a quick kick in the pants to just get, get them going, rev up that engine a little bit and get back, get back to basics, get back to what they were the year before when they made the playoffs? It's, it's hard to tell. All I know is that like, just based on the way they played last year, there's nothing about them that makes me, that I can look at their roster right now and think, yeah, they're a good team, they're going to win a bunch of games, they're going to have a game in the playoffs, they're going to have a shot at the title. No, I just, I look at the way they performed all year long and I'm like, Ugh. they're almost as bad as the Stars. Next we have what might come as the first shock on the list for some people. I have put at number 10, the Indiana Fever. And you might 
think that, you know, as they were phasing Tamika Catchings out, they were letting these young people learn and grow, training them to, you know, take over for when she's out. But, I mean, just look at how much has changed from this year to the next. Tamika Catchings, five-time defensive player of the year. She won the league and, and finals MVP. They're losing their head coach and Stephanie White as well. That's a lot of leadership that you're not going to have on the court with you. And it just, it changes things. I think they might struggle for a year or two. I mean, if you look at the games they played, they were never really the best, most talented team in the league. They get there through grit and grind, which is, you know, they, the definition of Tamika catching. You know, her playing style, they all adopted it, but, you know, without her gu guiding them, leading the way, she's consistently one of their top scorers, consistently a great defender. Even at her advanced age, she is clearly the best player on the team. Without her there, there will be a few struggles. There will be a small adjustment period. And I think they're going to find themselves in the lottery for the next couple of years. Next up, I have the Dallas Wings. And their transition into Texas was... Yeah, it, was, it was a little cringy at times. They have so much talent on this roster. They have three possible MVP candidates with Diggins, Sims, and even Glory Johnson as she continues to get older, but she's still putting up 2020 games when she's healthy. And I think for this team, health is one of the biggest issues they have to deal with because it, it, they, it seems to be just a regular issue for them struggling to keep their best players on the floor. And, you know, even when their best players are on the floor, you still see them throwing away games that time, giving up big leads, or just losing some of those close ones. I think they are on the verge of greatness, and they just, like, it's just, it's a very small hump that they need to get over there, but that hump is still there. I, I think they're a playoff-worthy team. I just don't know if they will be playoff-ready next year. I won't, wouldn't be shocked if it happened, I'm just not expecting it yet. I still think they have a lot to prove, and I need them to just show me something before I can just be at, as high on them as I would like to be, because they are a talented team, and I do enjoy watching them play when they are playing well. But they don't play well in l enough times for me to say that I will look forward to every single game. Next up, we have our first playoff bound team. Well, I have chosen a team that, much like Dallas, they are on the fringe of greatness and they just need a little bit more of a boost to really finish them off. And I think for this team, that boost might just be experience. Just give them time and let them slowly develop into a top elite team. And next up, I feel like I should say 10, 11, 12, I feel like they have no chance of making the playoffs. 8 and 9 will basically be fighting each other off. And then I feel like 7 through 1, almost guaranteed to make the playoffs and it's just a matter of fighting for position. And I have chosen that number 7, the Atlanta Dream. Now, if you've been on this channel for a few years, because I've been doing this for a while now, but I've never been high on Angel McCautry. That being said, she is a very talented player and she's turning into a really good leader. And I think as long as she's on the team, they are very capable of winning games. They are very capable of making playoffs. And she still has a lot of talent around her. They had a great offseason last year. And it's the, the thing that concerns me most about them, the reason I put them this low is because like, I have trouble accepting them as anything more than a 500 team because on any given night, they can win big or they can lose big, they can win the close ones, they can lose the close ones, they can have a seven game winning streak or a five game losing streak. Like The season for them was so up and down, it's hard to predict where they come next. One year you think they're going to be the best in the East and then they end up just being the worst. And then the next year, after they were the worst in the East, you don't see them making too many big moves. You're figuring, okay, another season of struggling and rebuilding and they end up being able to fight for the top of the East most of the season. Yeah, and it's just, it's, it's hard to predict. And so just, it's just, a, there's just, the nature of this team is just, I can't figure it out quite yet. But I do think there's enough talent on the roster. Angel McCautry alone almost guarantees them playoff positioning. And now we get to the really interesting part. Six to one were the hardest ones to pick. You know, and I chose that number six to put the Seattle Storm. 
they have, the reason I put them in the playoffs as high as six is because they have three first overall draft picks in their starting lineup, all of who look like they're guaranteed first ballot Hall of Famers. Sue Bird, if you look at the numbers that she had this year, if in 2017 she has the exact same number of assists that she had in 2016, she would pass Teacher Pinichero for the number one all-time leader in career assists. I think she's more than capable of doing that, and I don't even think 2017 would be her last season. Like, I think she's still got at least three good years left in her, and then maybe two or three mediocre years after that. And then if she wants to, she can play till she's 40, and she'd probably really start to suck, but we'll still respect her in ways because she's Sue. That, and then, on the same lineup with her, you've got Brianna Stewart, the default rookie of the year. No one ever questioned it. You know, she's been flirting with triple doubles so many times already. I mean, it's only a matter of time before she starts getting three to five every single season. And, you know, of course, Jewel Lord, you can't underestimate her. You know, she, like, even though I talked about, mentioned her third, she's still one of the most talented guards in the league. And it's just that she's working with two legends already. The only reason I put them as low as six is because the five teams above them have already proven that they can be successful from one season to the next. Next up at number five, I have put the Phoenix Mercury. They struggled a lot last year, and I still am not sure what necessarily went wrong. But I can tell you what's going wrong next year, and that's Penny Taylor is retiring. She's a three-time champion in this league, and you can't lose you know, someone like that without it affecting you. But that being said, I don't think it will hurt them as much as you know, Tamika Catchings will hurt the Fever. Because Phoenix, they've still got Bonner and Dupree leading a tremendous cast of playmakers, you know, a great supporting cast. And of course, Diana Taurasi, as long as you've got her, you've got a damn good shot at the playoffs. And of course, Brittany Griner, you know, she had a triple-double this season. You know, she's still one of the best post defenders in the league. She guards the paint very well, continues to put up tremendous blocking numbers. And you know, she, she's looking just tremendous, and she just continues to get better and better every season. I look forward to seeing how much more she continues to grow. As long as you've got that two-headed beast, this is a dangerous team. You know, it's going to be hard to match up against both of them. And then if they can conduct supporting cast, can lend them the hand that they need, continue to improve the bench play, they've got a real shot at shot, solid shot of making the not only the playoffs again, but making yet another deep run to try and get to the finals and try to win it all. Now we move on to the top four teams. And you know what? Spoiler alert, it's basically just where they finished the end of the regular season. Like the top four, you can already guess what they are. But starting with number four, we've got the Chicago Sky. Every year since they drafted Elena Della Don, they have been in the playoffs, and I don't see that ever changing. Health is one of the biggest concerns for them, especially Elena. She's had difficulty both with injuries and illness, staying on the court at times. But they still got a tremendous supporting cast. They still have Captain Pondexter, who can still play at a high level. Vandersloot and Quigley, they're still, they, they still are capable of making plays and helping guide this team. They drafted a tremendous young center in Jermani Boyette, who showed up fantastically in the second half of the year, and especially in the playoffs. She's looking like a double-double machine. You know, she'll have numbers that can start rivaling grinders at some point in time. This team is loaded with talent, and they have tremendous coaching, and as long as they can stay healthy, there will be very few teams that do not struggle against them. Then we move on to number three, New York Liberty. They've been the class of the East for the last couple of seasons. They've got a tremendous defense, and then Tina Charles, she's a double-double machine. She needs a little more help offensively. They made some moves this offseason that they thought would, you know, be that difference. Turns out not so much. Like Tina Charles, she's going to continue to be a double-double machine, could keep flooding with those triple-doubles. She'll continue to be an MVP candidate, and I think on strong defense alone, New York will continue to just dominate, especially at home. And the only reason they were number three this year is because they couldn't beat the two top teams in the league who ended up fighting each other in the finals. And I think that will continue to be a struggle for them this season. And then we move on to our top team, two teams, which if you haven't guessed it already, number two, Los Angeles Sparks. They won a title, 
They, they've got two MVPs and a six woman of the year on their team, and I think they're hungry to repeat, which is something that only two franchises have done in the history of this league, the Comets and the Sparks, and they have a legacy that they want to carry on. That being said, I put them at number one, two, only because Minnesota is still Minnesota. You may be able to beat them in the playoffs, but all this year, they played each other eight times, the series went four and four. So it's hard to say for sure that either team is really better. It was basically just every other game. First the Lynx won, then the Sparks, then the Lynx, and because of that, the Lynx won the regular season series. But then they get into the playoffs and they continue with that, and because it's only five games, Sparks, Lynx, Sparks, Lynx, Sparks. So if we continue down the same path, then the regular next year in 2017, it'll be Lynx, Sparks, Lynx again. So there you go. That's the entire reason I put Lynx at number one. Maya Moore, every year that since she's been in the league, the Lynx have been winning 20 points. 20 games a season, and I don't ever see that changing. She's going to be an MVP candidate every season. The one thing I will say, though, the Lynx do have an expiration date because Maya is the only player in the starting lineup under the age of 30. There's only going to be so long that you can keep this core group together before they really start struggling and then just fall off completely. But with that in mind, I've underestimated the Lynx before, and every time I do that, they're proving me wrong. So, from now on, as long as their core starting five remains in place, I'm just putting them number one every single on every single power ranking. So, for those of you who have stuck around all season and watched every single one of my videos, I thank you for that. I truly appreciate it, and I will see you again probably in 2017. So until the next time I upload a video on the channel, my name is Nathan Lyle, this has been The Fan Perspective, I hope you had a great season.